The era of easy money is over. I don't have to tell you that, you already know. After 14 plus years of 0% interest rate policy and quantitative easing, now moving in the opposite direction, where the Fed used to be buying its own government bonds and being a perpetual player in that market, it is now allowing them to mature and financial institutions to have that asset, those assets wither away off their balance sheet. But the flip side of the token is that this increases credit stress for corporate borrowers, for commercial borrowers, and of course, for you and I, the consumer. Now, capital has been grossly misallocated over the last 14 years as a direct result of money being too artificially cheap. Uh, and now, as the piper comes a knocking to be paid, that grossly misallocated capital is going to be wiped out. And there is an increasingly building corporate commercial real estate, Airbnb, and consumer debt time bomb. And we're gonna talk about all of it up next in today's video. But the first thing I wanna talk about is the sponsor of today's video, and that is river.com. You can invest in confidence uh, into Bitcoin at river.com slash TBL. You can securely buy Bitcoin with 100% full reserve custody. So these guys aren't in FTX, they're not a Celsius, they don't fractionally reserve your Bitcoin, they have your proprietary multi-sig solution so that all the Bitcoin you buy is held in reserve. Uh, and you can even enjoy zero fees when you set up a dollar cost average order. You can enjoy a fully hosted Bitcoin miner too, completely hassle free if you want to get it on Bitcoin mining, but you don't want all the hassle of setting one up. Again, invest in Bitcoin with confidence at river.com slash TBL. Now let's dive into it. The first thing we're going to talk about is corporate bonds and loans. So corporate bankruptcies, they've begun rising in 2023. That's not good. Um, they had an adir uh, or a, a trough of 25.4 uh, in early 2022, and the Bloomberg Corporate Bankruptcy Index has now risen to a staggering 73.7 at the time of this video. That's absolutely insane, right? Of course, it's risen very high. Now, this index, uh, it can go a lot higher, right? We're, we're really just at the early phase of recession, but the credit contraction beginning here and bankruptcy is starting to rise at the margin tells us that it is just beginning. Um, and of course, when companies go bankrupt, they're officially declaring that they can no longer pay down their bond and loan obligations. Now, how many companies are like this? Well, there is a total of $590 billion in corporate debt that is at risk of not being paid back to banks and to corporate bondholders. That's not good at all. Take a look at this chart here. This is your visual for it. Uh, now, this is called distressed debt. Um, this just means bonds that are trading at a 1,000 basis point spread or more, and loans uh, that are trading at a 1,000, uh, excuse me, uh, those are bonds that are trading at 1,000 basis point spread, um, and loans that are trading below 80 cents. So that is considered distressed, very low likelihood that they'll be able to pay them back, and the lion's share of this debt, arguably, is going to end up uh, in default. Uh, and before that, of course, it ends up delinquent or late. Now you have loans and bonds that are 30 days late on a payment, 90 days late on a payment, and then, of course, official default. Now, you know, as uh, businesses tighten their belts, um, you know, banks, of course, are, are extending less credit into the real economy as lending standards rise, um, thanks to the Fed's tightening. Um, and eventually, less credit gets extended into the real economy as a result of that. And that's what's called a deleveraging. Now, that can happen in one of two ways. The first way is through voluntary repayment and then downsizing your business so you don't rely on as much debt, or through default. And that's the more cataclysmic way. Um, because if you voluntarily repay uh, your loans, the lender is made whole and they just uh, back away from markets. They don't actually take a huge loss, right? They're not taking a big loss. But if you default on a payment obligation and don't pay it down in full, that's when lenders take a huge hit and that's when banks can go belly up. And then it's up to the Fed to save them. So that's the amount of distressed debt that's in the economy. Um, one other disconcerting thing is, so, okay, so how much of this, uh, these junky borrowers, these bad borrowers are in the economy? Well, we call those borrowers high yield borrowers or you've heard it probably as junk debt. Now. Junk bonds and leveraged loans, which are, of course, two parts of the debt market, again, reserved for those that are less credit worthy, more, likelihood, more likely to default, that has doubled from 2008, uh, doubled uh, from 2008, uh, which was uh, at $3 trillion, roughly speaking. Um, excuse me, it has doubled to $3 trillion from 2008 to 2021. So the uh, amount of these junk borrowers in the economy has doubled since the great financial crisis. Um, a big explosion of junk debt relative to the size of US economic activity is not good, right? Ultimately, you want more creditworthy borrowers so that they can weather 
uh, these times where lending standards are tight. If you have junkier borrowers, you have a much higher proclivity for those people to default, for lenders uh, to experience those huge losses and then go belly up. And this isn't just an issue here in the United States. The same thing has happened in Europe and the same thing has happened in China. Uh, for example, European junk bond sales jumped 40% in 2021. That's not good, right? Um, ultimately, you want more creditworthy borrowers in an economy to withstand these extremely aggressive uh, 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 lending lending standards tightening, not less creditworthy borrowers. Um, the other thing is the question of when are these bonds maturing? When are these actual? Uh, when when is it that we are going to experience these uh, th this occurrence of all of this debt maturing? And then, uh, of course, companies that won't be able to stomach it uh, backing away, either uh, paying down their debt and not taking on as much or voluntarily defaulting. 40% um, of junk bonds coming due in uh, the next two years, right? And that's $785 billion worth of global junk debt is, uh, uh, that's coming due is issued during the pandemic. And it's going to come due, come due through 2024 through 2026. And so the next three years or the next two years and uh, however many months is going to be the time when you start to see companies that can, can no longer finance their debt at these high rates back away. And when they don't have the debt, when they, don't, they can't finance their operations, they scale back in their operations in the form of selling assets and firing people. And that's when you see the real economic recession take hold. Uh, and now we're already seeing we're already seeing the uh, you know the the actual issuance of junk debt crater. We're already seeing companies who can't afford these rates issue much less debt. Take a look at this. Um, the junk bond index, the average maturity has fallen, right? Junk debt issuance from companies is cratered, totally cratered. And this is the exact same thing that happened in the lead up to the great financial crisis, to the 2001 dot-com blow up, and so on and so forth. When rates get high, companies that are less credit worthy and have uh, a far uh, lower ability to pay down their debt, they don't issue as much. And that's exactly what we're seeing right now. Uh, the other thing is that more stressed borrowers have to dump assets in order to pay back their debt and they stave off default. Uh, a couple of examples of that, pubs and grocers in the US, UK, and France are selling hundreds of their locations in order to pay down their debt. Um, while places like New York, San Francisco, and Houston, office space is being sold at an extreme haircut and being liquidated um, to do exactly the same. Sell assets so that way you don't default on your debt. Um, so there are 120 major bankruptcies uh, and major bankruptcies are corporations with at least $10 million in liabilities. And of course, remember, bankruptcy is officially declaring that you are no longer able to pay down your debt obligations that have occurred in the U.S. alone so far in 2023. Uh, that's quite substantial. It's a pretty big deal. Uh, only less than 15% of the $590 billion in distressed global debt has defaulted so far, which means that roughly half a trillion in debt is still at risk of not being paid back to lenders. Now, if we take a look at this other chart here, uh, this is total corporate debt maturing. Now, it's not just the junk debt that we talked about, but it's total corporate debt maturing. Um, and about $230 billion of this debt matures through the rest of 2023, $790 billion in 2024. And the meat of this refinancing for all corporate borrowers is going to occur in 2025. So this is where the moment of truth is, right? What companies can survive, how many can't, and how many employees do they have to lay off in order to make ends meet? Ultimately, companies that cannot survive a jump from 2% to 8 to 10% interest rates will die. And that's a fact. So ultimately, um, Moody's, right, this ratings agency, they conservatively expect defaults to peak at 5.1% by April 2024. Uh, and its pessimistic scenario is that high yield defaults jump as high as 13.7%, which, of course, that actually exceeds the level reached during the great financial crash. So more companies defaulting, more of these high yield junk companies, uh, will pessimistically, in this pessimistic scenario laid out by Moody's, will default in the 2023, 2024, 2025 recession than it will happen, then will have happened through the height of the great financial crisis. That's disconcerting. And of course, coming from Moody's, which is a ratings agency, and giving the proclivity of ratings agencies to severely underestimate the probability of crisis, and that's either out of stupidity or malice, we lean towards the latter. That latter scenario of high yield defaults peaking above 10%, that seems like the more likely probability to me, just again, given the uh, rear view mirror-esque way that ratings agencies like Moody's like to do their business. Of course, here is a, a still from the big short um, where 
this character said that defaults over 8% were impossible, that there'd be a million homeless. And of course, uh, default levels and the level of crisis within an economy is always underestimated. This happens every single cycle. Now, I'd like to take another break to thank our second sponsor of the Bitcoin layer, Foundation Devices. Foundation Devices is self-custody done right, you guys. You can start with their easy-to-use and private mo private mobile wallet called Envoy. You can download it for free on the Google Play Store or the App Store. Then you can transfer it to the most intuitive Bitcoin hardware wallet in the game, the Passport. You guys know this. I've been a fan of the Passport for ages now. It's extremely intuitive, and ultimately, if we want Bitcoin to be mass-adopted, you got to give you people, you got to give your friends, your family a device that they'll know how to use. They'll know how to use Passport right out of the box. It looks like a phone, feels like a phone, has a D-pad. You'll know how to use it. And therefore, if you've been on the fence about taking your Bitcoin off exchanges and actually taking self-custody of Bitcoin the way it was meant to be used, you can use Foundation's suite of intuitive self-custody devices and, hard and uh, software wallet options to make that happen. Take custody of your Bitcoin today by visiting foundationdevices.com or by clicking the link in the video description if you're watching on YouTube. And now let's get back to the uh, analysis of the corporate debt situation. So now let's move into commercial real estate. We talked about corporate debt and ultimately this entire video is just about the fallout ultimately of these rate hikes. We've had like this 15 month grace period where the Fed hiked interest rates, but now there are actual lags, 15 to 18 month lags on average between when those rate hikes actually translate into tight borrowing. And now we are at the phase where tight borrowing is rearing its head. And so the question that we're answering in this video is where is that going to occur and what's the fallout going to look like? So commercial real estate, we've talked about this several times before. If you follow me on Twitter or if you uh, have been a fan of this YouTube channel, if you're watching on YouTube, uh, commercial real estate has a basket of very unique and acute risks that are unique to it as an asset class. Commercial real estate, of course, they are faced with not just these extremely elevated rates, but also high levels of vacancy as post pandemic, people have moved away from the office and they've increasingly just started working from home. I know that I am currently working from home. Uh, here's the commercial real estate delinquency rate. Um, of course, delinquency meaning late loan payments. And these are uh, loans by property type that are 30 days late. Now, these are percentages. And you can note how every single category of loan delinquency has risen over the past year um, with past due payments for office space. Note the office column, which is the fifth one down here, having risen the sharpest out of all of them. Note, uh, 12 months ago, office delinquencies were at 1.62%, and now office loan delinquencies as of last month, July 2023, are at 4.96%. That's a pretty huge spike. So why are why are office payments struggling with their pay? Well, why are office uh, uh, borrowers struggling with their payments? Well, it's pretty simple. Um, if you look at this chart here, post-pandemic vacancies, uh, total U.S. metro office space vacancies are at 19%, and that's as of March 31st. It's probably much worse now. And again, this is a very conservative estimate. So if you don't have any revenue because nobody's in your building, you can't pay off your loan, right? And so these late loan payments keep piling up for office space. Um, that's a pretty huge, uh, huge deal. The, the fact that vacancies are at their highest level ever should concern a lot of people. Uh, and now, just like I mentioned, uh, unfortunately, this data is owned by Moody's. And as we said earlier, you can always trust ratings agencies to downplay the severity of a crisis. Now, vacancies in major metropolitan areas may be closer to 50% in actuality, according to some firsthand accounts, rather than the 19% posted by Moody's. Of course, you can always trust ratings agencies to have their blinders on, much like in 2008. Moving forward, uh, if we isolate the delinquent rate of office mortgages, right, just taking that rate that uh, office mortgages are delinquent and putting it on its own chart, you can see here that the rapid rise in late payments is already outpacing the great financial crisis. Take a look at the ascent of this line here. It took several months for late uh, commercial mortgage-backed securities and commercial uh, real estate loan payments to uh, actually tick up to where they were, uh, peak crisis, they were close to 11%. And now we went from, in, in just a few months, from basically 2% to uh, 5% and moving higher. Not good, not good at all for office space. Um, so how many of this, how, how many distressed U.S. offices are there? Well, um, distressed U.S. offices, which again, those who are most at risk of defaulting on their loan obligations, like we talked about with corporate debt, have jumped to $24.8 billion, and they lead all other properties in default risk. Um, uh, so even without defaults, right? It, let's ignore defaults. Let's say for one minute, and for whatever reason, um, you know, these uh, everybody went back to the office, right? 
most will just drop their leases and leave the empty buildings to the banks, right? Let's say that um, the, these, these, because uh, ultimately a structural change isn't going to happen where all of a sudden everybody moves back to the office. It's just not going to happen. Um, this is a structural shift that just hasn't been experienced in any pre previous cycle. So what's going to happen is if these mortgages get paid off and we don't see a huge amount of defaults, then all you're going to see is that these banks will be left with a, a, a shit ton of empty buildings, right? Pardon my French. And these banks, again, which are mostly regional banks, the ones that are already under a huge amount of stress, will not have a market to sell them into because the commercial real estate supply is already abundant and conversions to residential property are rare and expensive and time consuming. These buildings just don't have any use anymore. Now the small banks are holding all of them and they don't have a market to sell them into. That's not good at all. Uh, to take a look at the severity of this, small banks hold 68.2% of all commercial real estate loans. Alarm bells, that should be sending off alarm bells in your head. Um, they have 1.9 trillion in uh, the commercial real estate loans. They're responsible for 1.9 trillion of the total commercial real estate lending today. Whereas large banks, your city groups, Bank of America, JP Morgan, et cetera, are responsible for just 0.89 trillion. That's crazy, right? So these 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 loans are very heavily concentrated in the hands of small banks, which is the most at-risk loan category for now. That's going to be the death knell for plenty of regional banks out there. Uh, now, you can actually see the correlation between their two respective stock indexes right here. As office space goes, so too goes the regional banks. And it just makes sense. With these defaults, with corporate defaults, with commercial real estate defaults, and ultimately with consumer defaults too, it's all going to come down to who is the impacted counterparty? Who is the lender? Who lent that money to that entity? Uh, and in the case of commercial real estate, more often than not, it's small banks. So sayonara, I'd expect a tremendous deal of small banks to go the way of the dodo. Unfortunately, it just is the way that it is. Now, one thing here is that uh, if we take a look at office towers, if we take a look at these office spaces, well, how bad is it? Well, there are huge discounts um, of over 50% in Manhattan, 70% in San Francisco, and over 80% in Houston. That's how big of a haircut some of these buildings are selling for, so much so that banks don't want to hold the loans to these anymore. Banks are looking to completely unload all of these commercial property loans so they can de-risk a little bit. But ultimately, they have no market to sell them into. Take a look at this right here. Property loans are so unappealing that banks want to dump them. But unfortunately, there aren't buyers. There are no buyers for these loans. The so banks are stuck holding these loans. Now, in 2008, it was an issue of bad mortgage origination, right? Re originating to risky borrowers. And in 2023, it's not that at all. It's just the fact that we have now lived through this structural change where the asset that was borrowed to finance is no longer being used, that asset being office space. And so no longer generating revenue What's going to happen to all the lenders, right? That's the question you should be asking yourself right now, and that's the question we hope to answer. Um, it's all about reducing your exposure to these people. Ultimately, the rules of the game have not changed, right? Now, there is a swath of unsellable mortgage bonds, not, not for the same reason as in 2008, for an entirely different reason, but the reality stays the same. These mortgage bonds are unsellable, they're held by banks, and ultimately the cash flows will only continue to dry up as these uh, office spaces need to refinance their debt and they reach the end of their maturities. Um, to illustrate just how bad it is, and of course, the company we work is terrible. It has its own unique set of circumstances that that make it uniquely terrible. But of course, it is a, a, a firm that has a great deal of office space. To take a look at just how much investors are trying to get, get out of Dodge when it comes to office space, WeWork's bonds now yield almost 90%. Uh, for context, they were sold at 8.4% in 2008. And they now yield almost 90%, which is basically trading at default levels. Basically, this is saying WeWork's not going to make it until the next year or the, or the following year. They're done. And this is just a small preview from, a, again, a uniquely terrible commercial real estate firm about just how non-existent the demand for commercial real estate debt is. Um, it's, uh, you know, these entities are quietly unloading commercial real estate debt from regional banks. Um, ultimately, regional banks do not want any of this uh, this debt on their books. They don't want it. And it will soon turn into a rush for the exits. If, you, if you'll recall this scene here from the big short, um, uh, you know, Brownfield Fund, this guy trying to unload a boatload of uh, commercial mortgage-backed securities onto a willing, uh, willing and able buyer. In this case, it's going to be commercial mortgage-backed securities for office space. So the last thing that I want to talk about today is the Airbnb bubble, or the Airbnb bubble, however you'd like to say it. Um, obviously, we, we, we've talked about corporate debt. We've talked about um, this commercial real estate debt. Let's talk about Airbnb. So Airbnb is an interesting case. Uh, ownership for Airbnb has kind of exploded in popularity um, over the last several years. 
it ramped up following 2020 as travel started to pick back up and low rate borrowers, which were led on by social media gurus, sought to capitalize on the passive income craze. But it turns out there's no such thing as passive income. It, it's all just one big carry trade with a different name. Of course, a carry trade is when you borrow at a low interest rate to invest at a high interest rate. Now, these are usually performed on a cross-currency basis. Say, if I wanted to borrow in yen, which has a low cost uh, to borrow, a very low interest rate environment, uh, to then invest into US dollar capital markets, which have a higher yielding capital market, then I would capture the spread between the two so that I'm borrowing and lending as my profit. So I borrow at a low interest rate, invest at a high interest rate, I capture that spread, that's my profit. Now, there's one rub to carry trades though. There's one unfortunate aspect about that. They totally fall apart when your borrowing rate rises, particularly if it rises above the rate you're earning on your investment. And that is what has happened. We've seen the yield curve invert. Front end yields are higher than long end yields. Uh oh, that decimates the carry trade. And the yield curve inversion, the same notion, has also decimated Airbnb. That's precisely what hap is happening to Airbnb owners today. Interest rates on mortgages available to mo multiple property owners are rising and revenues are down astronomically in key markets by nearly 50%. Take a look here, Airbnb revenue collapse, top 10 cities, Phoenix and Austin, Sa Sa uh, uh, Sevierville, Tennessee, I don't know if I'm pronouncing that correctly, Myrtle Beach, South Carolina, San Antonio, down almost 50% in all of these top areas and 30% elsewhere. No good, no good. Again, similar scenario to commercial real estate. You got a loan under the assumption that you'd be able to have continual cash flow, right? But now the unfortunate thing is that cash flow is drying up. People's pockets are running dry. Consumer credit is falling. People are taking on far less credit. And as a result, they're not going on as much travel. If you take a look here, we just had the first instance in a very, very long time of revolving consumer credit, which is credit cards, um, fall. Uh, we, we haven't seen that in 28 months. We haven't seen uh, discretionary spending like travel uh, fall in a very, very long time. And that's what is happening. People are reducing their outstanding credit to brace for recession, revolving credit net changes now negative. And of course, to the detriment of Airbnb owners. Uh, now, what has happened, right? What, what has happened as a result of this? Well, actually, first, what is the concentration of Airbnbs? How big could this problem possibly be? And I don't want to sensationalize here, but how big could this problem be? Well, let's just take a look at the facts. Uh, one of the facts is that um, Airbnb inventory versus homes for sale. Currently, there are uh, over or right around about 1 million vacation, by, uh, vacation rentals by owner on all these short-term vacation rental platforms, including Airbnb relative to the 570,000 total properties for sale in the housing market. So 1 million, close to 1 million Airbnbs and other type units like Verbo compared to 570,000 homes for sale. That's insane. There's a huge oversaturation of Airbnbs compared to existing housing and dwindling demand. It's never been more <laughs> stark, right? The, the, the Airbnb bubble is absolutely huge. Um, and when owners decide to sell due to revenue slipping, right? Because we just mentioned consumers are tightening their belts, taking on less credit. People aren't going on as many vacations. When, when owners of these Airbnbs decide to sell uh, due to revenue falling below their rate that they're borrowing, the mortgage that they have, there will barely be a market for them to sell into. Similar situation to all of these small regional banks holding these commercial real estate bonds that are now trying to unload them and commercial real estate loans that are trying to unload them. There isn't a big market to sell them into. Um, that's what we're seeing here uh, as an example with Airbnb. Now, if we tally Airbnbs across cities, um, it's almost getting as exhausting as tallying the 17 Dunkin' Donuts that are in uh, my hometown, uh, my, my small New England hometown. It's insane. A pro pro population of like 17,000, basically. And there's, uh, uh, you know, a Dunkin' Donuts on almost every block. It's nuts. And that's how oversaturated the city of Paris looks uh, right now. Take a look at the map of the city of Paris. It's completely saturated with Airbnbs. Now, granted, Paris is a tourist city. That totally makes sense. But they, it, it's dotted the entire map. There is no area where there isn't an Airbnb or several Airbnbs within the same block. It's kind of insane. Um, there are 44,000 in New York City. There are 82,000 in London, 45,000 in Los Angeles. And of course, as I mentioned, Paris is inundated with 62,000 Airbnbs, completely covering a map of the city. Oversaturated, totally oversaturated. And all, unfortunately, same as with commercial real estate, vacancies are surging. If you take a look at a previously burgeoning market, just like, uh, like Nashville, Tennessee, vacancies are surging to their highest level since the pandemic of 8%. Again, 
That is not good for these mortgage financiers that own several Airbnbs. Vacancies are surging. That's no good. Um, now, ultimately, they'll be left to sell into a market, again, with no buyers. Same exact issue. Um, of course, I mentioned mortgages in 2007 were originated by these unethical mortgage brokers who were trying to prey on the American dream of owning a home. But mortgages in 2022 were originated to unsuspecting victims of these Airbnb passive income gurus on TikTok who were really just selling an expensive carry trade to the financially illiterate. Right? They were saying passive income, financial freedom, uh, just own several properties, you'll be fine. But ultimately, it was just it was just selling them the reality of going into a bank, getting a low rate loan and going and buying several Airbnbs. Um, now, it all falls apart when your revenue dries up and ultimately as well when your rates rise and both are happening right now. Even though the basket of risks and the, the circumstances are totally different between the two events, between 2007 and now, and I will not call now a repeat of the great financial crisis, I think that's um, sensationalist and, and silly and not rooted in reality, it, ultimately it's, uh, it's kind of a very similar scenario, right? But for different, different, different reasons. Um, <laughs> this is, uh, of course, another famous scene from The Big Short. Um, now, of course, in this scene, a stripper um, has five houses and a condo, and she has several loans out on each of them. Now you have school teachers, recent college graduates like myself, carpenters, and you know they now have mortgages on several short-term rental properties. So it was where this stripper had loans on five houses and a condo. Uh, all of these normal people, these people who aren't involved in uh, the financial world, now have several mortgages outstanding on several properties um, whose revenues are now drying up. Not good, right? Cycles cycles do not repeat themselves exactly, but they rhyme. They rhyme. And another disconcerting fact is the Airbnb co-founder sold $1 billion worth of his own stock since January. That doesn't exactly inspire, inspire confidence in the company's uh, financial stability or in the market stability of short-term rentals. Again, it all comes back to the lenders, right? And how badly they're going to suffer losses. That will determine the fallout of the recession that we end up entering, right? Credit cards, auto loans, uh, and total charge-offs um, have more than doubled in the uh, the last quarter. Now, and this is for a big bank like Wells Fargo, so it's arguably much worse for, for smaller banks who don't have as much of a cushion to uh, withstand those losses. And that's an insight into consumer lending. Now, just imagine how impaired small banks are who are holding the far worse off commercial real estate loans. Um, now, the fact that credit card usage doubled at the same time that charge-offs have doubled may point to the fact that more debt is being taken on without the intent to pay it back. That rhyme, that wasn't intentional. Uh, and that's the crescendo before the finale, ultimately. That's what that is. If people are taking on more debt, uh, sort of in this huge uh, wave and charge-offs are doubling at the same time as that credit card growth is doubling, that tells you people are taking on credit card debt without the intent of paying it back. Rates are so high right now, prices have doubled in two years, people are saying, screw it, one last hurrah. And that seems to be what is happening right now across industries. So how many lenders will go belly up? And who's gonna throw in the life preserver? Well, ultimately it's going to be the Fed, just like it has for every previous cycle. Um, when we take a look at several of these lenders, including Capital One, PNC Financial, Fifth Third Bank Corp, all of them have had their debt rating outlooks cut by Moody's Investor Service, uh, citing several sources of strain. Now, again, we're talking Moody's, so chances are they're late to the party and they're underestimating it. And if Moody's is saying that several of these banks are uh, facing several sources of strain, chances are it's all banks that are facing sources of strain from several areas, and it's all about borrowers, right? So boils down to this, right? Market cycles are like an elastic band. Um, you know, they can be stretched and stretched and stretched and stretched to their extreme, but they always have to return to this relaxed starting position. Now, the elastic band expanded during COVID and it's contracting right now, but elastic bands don't just go from expanded to relaxed. There is no discrete state change one to zero. Um, they're a continuous change and they're a continuous change from stretched to unstretched. Now, that change can either occur with steady relaxation or with a snap, right? Ultimately, if these borrowers default and lender impairment is so high that it creates this domino effect of selling of assets and loans uh, and the failure of financial institutions, 
it could very well end in a snap, but I certainly hope that it does not. That's all for today's video. You guys, I really appreciate you sticking with me to the end. Of course, uh, you can follow this account if you're watching on Twitter or make sure to subscribe to the YouTube channel if you're watching over there. Uh, now, a special thank you to our sponsor, River Financial. Of course, River is the Bitcoin exchange of choice for the long-term investor. You can securely buy Bitcoin with 100% full reserve custody, enjoy zero fees on recurring orders, and even buy a hosted Bitcoin miner totally hassle for you guys. I use River, I'd highly recommend it. And today you can get $5 free when you buy $100 in Bitcoin at river.com slash TBL. Invest in Bitcoin with confidence, go to river.com slash TBL or click the link in the video description if you're watching on YouTube. That's all for today, everybody. Take care.